Misha, who is a poet, a storyteller, a writer, a musician, comes originally from Calcutta, spent most of his life in Wayland, Massachusetts. Misha recalls how, as family, they would reunite in trips back to Calcutta, and how compelled he was to record family happenings in a song or a story of fish frying like a song, a dog barking to a downbeat. And so he began to write stories and make music as a child. He pursued theater uh, afterwards, uh, as well as uh, more singing. He was awarded a Fulbright to return to Calcutta and develop a collection of poems to look to his memoirs, rituals, and desires as cartography of his inheritance. His poems have appeared in Hayden's Ferry Review, the Portland Review, Asian American Literary Review, and others. Misha says uh, in a quote, for me, poetry has never been, as Audre Lorde said, a luxury. As a queer transplanted Bengali coming of age in America, I was impelled to scavenge materials and mold to write myself and my world into being. More recently, he has been teaching at the Meridian Academy and he notes that his students that he works with inspire and inform in his writing these days. And one more quote to share before I invite him up. Misha has said, my students at Meridian, where I am humanities and theater teacher, never fail to remind me that storytelling can be the most courageous, the most radical act of all. I've been blessed in my journey to work with visionary artist scholars who challenge the boundaries between theory and practice art and knowledge making. It is their generosity of spirit and crucial vision I hope to pay forward in my own career as a poet, performer, public intellectual, and educator. And so, with uh, ending with that quote, I very much look forward to hearing what Misha has to share this morning, and I invite you all to please give a warm welcome to Misha Chowdhury. Creation myth. My child bride, great grandmother, and a Hilsa fish. She bends bone with her girl hands, her mother hands willing flesh to fall away with ease, with ease. Shh, she breathes. It will be easier if you forget the river. Shh, she breathes the damp of the floor into her feet, the cold packed dirt that holds her captive in this new murder. Shh, she whispers. It will be easier if you forget your swimming eye too dry to see the river has abandoned you, her eyes swimming with sweat, the stink of skin stripped from meat, divided into iron pans here, the back, the stomach there, the blade has stained her girl hands, her mother hands, with the metal spice of its stench, she swears. I will set you a swim again, in cumin, in turmeric, in clove, and you will glow golden, shh, the snap of a skeleton in her girl hands, her mother hands her a memory of water. The sky fingers gray into the horizon. Her mother holds her quiet in her own girl hands, the sweat of her palms remembering the journey. Shh, she breathes. It will be easier if you forget. <clears throat> So um, I start with that poem, uh, I think that, that Cheryl gave a, a, an effusive uh, introduction. Um, but um, I think it's always wonderful to start with a creation myth. Um, and um, as Cheryl said, I grew up between, between places, between continents, between um, my life here uh, in the Americas and, uh, and my life back home in, in India where, where most of my family is and where my, uh, where my land is in many ways. Um, and so something that I'm always grappling with um, and I'm interested in grappling with 
um, Cheryl talked about healing, um, is what it means for me uh, as an Indian to be on this land. Um, and this poem came out of uh, an exploration that, um, sort of an ongoing exploration of um, understanding my own family's history in terms of uh, colonialism. Um, and my family uh, was uh, in Bengal in, the, in, in 1947 when the British left. There was a partition. Bengal was divided into two. Uh, into, in, in two. And, um, and so this poem, in many ways, uh, we Bing Bengalis are people of the river, uh, of rivers, um, and we eat a lot of fish. Um, but this is also a poem about partition. Um, and so um, I certainly personally have always grappled with uh, where that uh, sort of rift inhabits me. Um, but more importantly, I think, for, uh, for me reading here today, um, I'm interested in what um, it means for me as, uh, as a, an inheritor of sort of colonial history um, to be on sort of still colonized land here. Um, and what's different about uh, the history um, from which I come is that India was never uh, colonized by settlers. It was never a settler colonial state. Uh, and here, here we are um, as, uh, as part of a settler colonial project in many ways on this land. Um, and so this next poem that I'm going to read is, uh, is sort of addressing that anxiety that's always living in me. Um, Cheryl mentioned that I, I teach at Meridian Academy in Brookline, which is a wonderful place. Um, I do reference a, I, one of my colleagues is here today. Um, I'm not referencing you in this poem. So <laughs> this poem is called uh, Classroom Bulletin Board, American History. In the upper left-hand corner, an image of a woman half collapsed on the ground that is skulls and scapulas and ribs and vertebrae and humeri and toe bones of the murdered. I know she is a mother because the wisp of hair escaped from the fist of her bun has known pain and does not faint in the face of it. It holds its spine steady between the necessary collapse that brings her closer to the truth, the earth spits upward and survival. If she were not a mother, she would succumb to the magnetism of her own mother's jawbone calling to her from the gray of the ground. The colors are too bright, the alignment too even, but I push the last pushpin into the moldering cork to secure her alongside Wendy Rose's excavation at Santa Barbara Mission. They built the mission with dead Indians. 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 Behind me, my colleague's voice, that's morbid, and a little laugh. I used to dig for Indian clay at the edge of the lake in the old colony town I now call home, never registering the weight of my naming, reaching hands hungrily downward in search of where the sand gave way to something malleable, something that would clot beneath my fingernails, my grandfather's sepia feet sinking into blood-red mud, the crouching stillness of prey that sees the blindness of the hunter. He hid his rifles in the reservoir when the British patrols came through. But there is no memorial there, no cairn of smooth stones, no fossilized footprints at the water's edge. Wikipedia tells me the lake Kachichuit means place of rushing water in Algonquin. 
It also tells me the turnpike tore into the hillside that held a village of the same name. I imagine its walls are built of wet earth, sun dried. Women in flimsy saris slip patties of cow dung against them to harden in the heat. Outside my classroom window, a car pulls out of the unpaved parking lot. Weeds are breaking through the surface and blooming. My colleague asks me, what do you want your kids to take away from this? And everywhere, beneath the gravel, bones extend their answer upward through dandelions in wisps of seed that catch like an elder's scolding in my throat. I'm gonna read a couple of poems from a, a series that I've been working on called Kali Wakes in the Crematorium. Um, these were a series of poems that I began working on uh, after an experience a couple of years ago. I, my mother's family um, is a, an enormous sprawling family and that was the sort of womb that I grew up in. Um, and so there are always, uh, I, I say that the more you love, the more you have to lose. It's my family is so sprawling. Um, I have many, uh, many grandparents uh, and many of my grandparents are, have been passing uh, the past few years. Um, and so one of, my, one of my grandmothers, one of my great aunts, um, uh, the experience of, of being present uh, for her passing rites uh, was, a, was a formative moment for me because, because we live here, um, it's rare that we get to be back in time uh, to participate in the, in the passing rituals and the passing rites because by the time the two-day flight uh, journey uh, from here to there happens, um, the crematorium, the, the rites at the crematorium have already taken place. Um, and so this was in many ways, uh, my mother was there as well and, um, and, um, and I write about her father in these poems and um, I know that it was a, an important experience for all of us because uh, we hadn't been able to be present for many of these of these rites, and also it for me was about um, uh, I, about the way that those rites sort of brought me closer to an understanding of the sort of the viscerality of death um, that I hadn't experienced in other sort of passing rites um, here. Uh, so I'll just read a couple of poems from, and th this, this series of poems is, is written uh, as a play. Um, each of the poems is titled, uh, this one is titled, A Note on Setting and Character. We had a dog once who thought he was a conch shell and could call the evening to him. To his credit, he wasn't a poor mimic. His cavernous howl inspired many a pious union of palms as the dusty sun dipped over the rooftops of South Calcutta. We take our pets very seriously here. In this house with open doors, even death vies with the sparrows for the fish bones we scatter on the windowsills. They call this the zoo. We swarm in the stairwell barking in echoes to fill the cracks the lost have left in the plaster. The day my grandfather passed, my mother turned to see a crow alight among his chrysanthemums, eyes unmistakably bright, as if to say, I am tending to my garden. We sit at the foot of his photograph, all of us animals marveling at how quickly we become stern faces in picture frames, flanked by sweet-smelling flowers, roses on the left, and pink ribbons. On the right, carnations with an edge of blood and some blue orchid, so blue it looks entirely false. My aunt recalls how his ears turned blue before they reached the crematorium. My mother sings a wailing song. The clock keeps tempo with its strange, scratching heartbeat. And the puppy we bought to fill the cage he left vacant gnaws hungrily at his teething bone.
Act one, Gali wakes in the crematorium. She picks the crust from the corners of her eyes. She cracks her shoulders. In the grainy light of evening, the lines of the dead wend inevitably into the gray, air, the absence of color, the day's human smoke wandering out into the street to meet the diesel haze. It weighs down the city's leaves, moral, omniscient, falling like fallout from the carbon sky as if hearkening back to a truer black and white time when there was no pretense of smiling for family portraits, when those who should not have died had not yet. Stage directions. She is up against the glass. It is all that holds her against the gravity of her mother's womb, her mother, gray, and small and still, her womb wears a wreath of flowers. The wreath is a door. She knocks. Inside, the music of the sea. Don't resort to the moaning of whales for this. Remember your first ocean. Frequencies refracted, how her song came to you as sunlight through the slow patience of water. On the sidewalk, the audience, the terrible witnesses gather in postures of grief. But this is not tragic cinema. This scene answers to the undertow. The elder says, pay your last respects. Mar pae pronam takurene which means wade in the water. One last time, bury your toes in the mud. Let the heave of the tide take you. The elder holds her from behind as she touches her forehead to the lotuses of her dead mother's feet. And since what follows is beyond the compass of any depiction, put her in a glass-bottomed boat put her to sea. Let her audience be the stoicism of sea lilies, stalks swaying in the liquid wind. Let her go. Don't show her gasping for breath. Because her gills have peeled open, she is moaning the only syllable, ma, into the bright, callous sunlight as her limbs and her leaves dissolve into salt and water. And then I'll read one called Intermission, Waiting for a Furnace. The old pyres were too much mess, he says, his crisp shirt quibbling with the detour of his slouch. Sometimes pieces of whomever would fly up like ordinary cinders. I imagine the new weightlessness of these airborne organs, rising whole, helium held through an obsolete combusting case of skin. The woman across the waiting hall has collapsed into an everlasting wail. None of her masonry will hold her now. Here, even skeletons sublime. My mother warns me not to lean back against the stone wall. Someone has spat his chewed red beetle leaf behind me. In another poem, I would have said it looked like blood. Last monologue. Don't be squeamish. Put the flame directly in my mouth. This is what we mean when we say we are reborn. Watch me burn. Watch me closely. See how I take heat. See my lips curl inward and crumble. Did you turn the stove off when you left the house? 
turn your face from me now. Epilogue, P544, Raja Boshanturai Road, Kolkata 700029. The gate collapses open. Careful not to catch fingers in its rusted diamond holes, I have always been a cautious child. Sniff my fingertips, dull spice of iron recalling raw sugar on lips chapped to bleeding. The polluted city in winter when I never breathe easy, but I breathe deeply anyway. This is the gate through which we come and go. No suitcase, not this time. Simply the house, the old stairwell, and it's quiet. It is never quiet. In the corner, a shed shoddy crumpled, widow white. Step into its starched nest. Crisp folds give way to my light. Wait. It holds me the way I want to be held. Here where I become all angles and return. Where even when the wick of warm flesh has long burned out, I trust someone is waiting with neem leaves to cleanse me at the gate. Thank you. Lonely. How lonely it is to be in a world that functions on definition. To be undefined. Necessary names applied to conditions, states, understandings, but none for you. I struggle with my hair, attempting to avoid the stereotypes that come with it. Messy is unacceptable. Neat and in place, never flowing or tousled, never luckful and luxurious, always tight, controlled, treated and curled. Change is inevitable. Natural is a no-go. Maybe staying in one place becomes painful because it reminds me of how much I don't belong. Places with histories I've assumed are my own, but really they sound more like fairy tales. Once upon a slave ship. A poor excuse for an identity, pieced together and regurgitated at the appropriate times. Who am I? Where am I from? I'd like to think it doesn't matter. I'd like to think I'm part of a global community. I like to think that having no home helps to look forward to our real home.
wanted to be with you from day one and still today I know that it may never happen and that's okay the time we spent I will treasure the memories are unforgettable the day you said I love you will always be in my heart all I hope for is your happiness and to know that you once again Till then I wish you well I wish you well Well, well, well I wish you well Well, well I wish you well Well, well, well I wish you well Well, well I wish you well Peach and pear.